see I kind of kind of having pulled out of my house to buy a oh, so do I. So I have my house. I'll leave it out. You see cable there's a way and I have it on the wall. I I ended up yeah, we about ready to start, you think? Yeah. Ready okay. when you are. All right, great. I have 3.15, so uh, why don't we get started? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Nyberg from the U.S. Army War College, and welcome to the wild world of virtual conferencing. Uh, it is my pleasure to virtually chair this session. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the speakers all at once, uh, and then we'll go in the order in which I introduce them. So let me begin with John Beeler, who joined the University of Alabama's History Department in 1993. His publications include British Naval Policy in the Gladstone Disraeli Era, Imperial Defense, 1868 to 1887, The Birth of the Battleship, British Capital Ship Design, 1870 to 1881, The Milne Papers, Volume 1 and 2, uh, and he, the third volume of those mill papers is slated to appear in 2023. He has received the University of Alabama Alumni Association's Outstanding Commitment to Teaching Award, and most recently, he was named one of the top 300 professors in the United States by the Princeton Review. Well done. Thank Greg you. Kennedy is Professor of Strategic Foreign Policy and the Director of the Corbett Center for Maritime Policy Studies at the Defense Studies Department, King's College, London, based at the Joint Services Command and Staff College in Shrivenham. He is the author of the award-winning monograph, Anglo-American Strategic Relations in the Far East, 1933-39, to and has published internationally on strategic foreign policy issues, contemporary British security and defense policy, maritime strategy and security, disarmament, military education, diplomacy, economic warfare, and intelligence. I will be reading his paper as he's unable to attend uh, the conference in person. Jesse Tumblin is instructor in the Department of History at Duquesne University in scenic, wonderful Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He completed his PhD at Boston College and is a past fellow in International Security Studies at Yale and past winner of the Saki Doctoral Prize for International History at the IHR in London. His book, The Quest for Security, Sovereignty, Race, and the Defense of the British Empire, was published in 2020 by Cambridge University Press. And chairing this session is my friend John Mitchum, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of History at Duquesne University. His first book, Race and Imperial Defense in the British World, 1870 to 1914, was published by Cambridge in 2016 and was a finalist for the Templar Medal. He is currently finishing a new book, The Empire Club, Imperial Politics, White Supremacy, and the Making of the Commonwealth, under contract to Oxford University Press. John is general editor of the journal Britain and the World, and he is an elected fellow of the Royal Historical Society. So, John, you'll start. I'll read excerpts out of Greg's paper, and then we'll move on to Jesse. So, John, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, and, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, three caveats at the outset. I'm not going to try and say the title of my paper because I'll just stumble over two of the words. Uh, second, there is a Monty Python reference, but it's in the footnotes, so you won't hear it. And, uh, and third of all, I forget what the third one is. Um, uh, oh, spoiler alert. For those of you who came to hear a paper about Sir John Fisher, it's not much about Sir John Fisher. There's a passing reference to him at the end, but mostly it's pre-Fisher era. Through Throughout the early 19th century, and indeed prior to 1800, naval members of the Board of Admiralty, the British equivalent to the Navy Department, uh, and the organization of functioning of which I'll explain shortly, were frequently also members of Parliament, and thus expected to be political supporters of the government then in power. But whether or not they were in Parliament, they were selected on the basis of ideological loyalty. Tory governments appointed Tory naval officers to the board, while which governments uh, selected their own supporters. Hence, at every change of government, the entire board was switched out, with consequences for institutional continuity that scarcely need enlarging upon. As for the matter of selecting naval members of the board on the grounds of political or ideological loyalty, rather than professional ability, I'm initially looking at the Whig Admiralty of 1846, 1852, but one can find a similar situation personnel-wise in virtually every preceding board. Indeed, as was the case with the Whig board, the men selected were sometimes politicians first, and naval officers second. First Lord, the Earl of Auckland's two fir first two First Lords, Sir William Parker and Sir Charles Adams, were naval officers first and foremost, although the latter was also Whig politician Lord Meadows' brother-in-law, 
But when Adam left the board in July 1847, he was replaced as first naval lord by Sir James Whitley Dean Dundas, who was, in the words of Andrew Lambert, a political op operator, not a naval officer. <clears throat> Nor was Dundas the sole political appointee. Second naval lord Maurice uh, Barclay was a staunch weak partisan, but, and I'm quoting Andrew here again, narrow-minded, authoritarian, and uninspired, a man of limited abilities, more politician than admiral. And Lord John Hay, the third naval lord, was yet another political admiral. As a younger son of the seventh Marquis of Tweedale, or I should say Marquess, let's get it right. His family's Whig connections were long-standing. True, unlike Dundas, whose chief characteristics as a ship captain were, quote, a mania for neatness and his limited abilities as, sea as a seaman, Hay did have experience commanding a squadron. And true, he was interested in technology, but the manner in, in which he tried to voice his ideas upon the Board of Admiralty was counterproductive. By October 1847, he had, quote, become a nuisance to Lord Auckland. Until 1832, the practice of selecting naval members of the board on grounds of politics rather than professionalism had been tolerable, if not ideal. Prior to that year, all matters relating to the upkeep of the fleet, supervision of the dockyards, bookkeeping, billing, and naval medicine were handled by subordinate but semi-autonomous boards, the Navy Board and the Biddling Board, leaving the Admiralty to deal chiefly with larger matters. But Whig First Lord Sir James Graham abolished the subordinate boards in 1832 and transferred their duties to the Admiralty, which thereby came responsible for the fleet and commission, building and repairing ships, dockyards and stores, bookkeeping, medical provision for the personnel and provisioning. Were the Admiralty only a policy-making board, the fact that the naval lords might be politicians first and admirals second need not have been a crippling shortcoming. After all, policy-making was and it is inseparable from politics. But supervising all aspects of the Royal Navy's personnel and materiel required that the lords of the Admiralty be administrators as well as policy-makers, and men like Dundas and Barclay seem to have regarded their posts more as sinecures than as jobs. While Hay was more engaged in Admiralty business, his engagement was not all wholly beneficial. As Lambert notes Riley in his chairmanship of an 1846-47 committee on ship design, Hay looked for power without responsibility. On top of the acquisition of administrative duties, the Admiralty was, by the 1840s, contending with a rapidly growing volume of business, much of it related to the advent of steam power. This technological development, in turn, necessitated the wholesale transformation of the Royal Navy's methods of recruiting and retaining personnel. As a measure of the workload increase, in 1827, the board received uh, a little bit under 25,500 letters. Most of them, many of them from the Navy and Biddley boards, all had to be vetted and answered. The volume of outgoing correspondence was a little bit under 22,500 letters. By way of comparison, in 1856, the board received over 38,000 letters, many from the departments under its supervision, and dispatched a whopping 68,622. Which brings us to Captain Alexander Milne, the poster child for the board's, board's gradual conversion from a largely political entity to a largely professional one. Milne's antecedents were both naval and Tory, yet he seems to impress every superior officer under whom he served, including a stint as flag captain for radical and loose cannon canons of Charles Napier. Indeed, Napier was so taken with Milne's confidence and professionalism that he urged Lord Auckland to award him a knighthood. Auckland replied to Napier, you, you have long since heard that much better has been done for Captain Milne rather than giving him a knighthood, which is a foolish reward in any case. Hence, Lord Auckland stated not only his intention, but his hope when he told that Nap Napier that Milne would, quote, make a good working lord of the admiral, the end quote. There was pressing need for such in December 1847. Charles Adams, Charles Adam, himself a good working lord, had left the board a bit less than four months earlier. Real, Rear Admiral Sir Henry Prescott, the man who brought into the board to the board when Re Adam retired, left it in December 1847 to become superintendent of Portsmouth Doctor because he was not willing to stand for election to Parliament, thus creating the bill of the vacancy that Milne filled. Ergo, the Whig Prescott was replaced by a relatively junior captain of Tory antecedents. Moreover, and more significantly, when Milne had an interview with the Prime Minister, Lord John Russell, the two agreed that he was not to deal with political matters or patronage. Instead, Russell requested that Milne, quote, entirely devote his whole time to service details, end quote. Nor was he asked to run for Parliament with the expectation that he would, if elected, support the government. 
That's when Hoffman chose Milne as Prescott replacement, he, and again, I'm using Andrew Lambert's words, he began the process of breaking the link between a seat on the board and active political support for the government in the House of Commons. Although according to Graham's divisions of, Sir James Graham's division of responsibilities, Milne should only have been responsible for provisions and transport, but he quickly found himself, he quickly found out that he was expected to oversee almost all of the departments, the accountants generals, the accountant generals being the sole exception. Moreover, both Auckland and his successor as First Lord, Sir Francis Barry, employed Milne as the Board of Admiralty's one ad hoc one-man naval staff. So by default, he became its principal, if not its sole administrator and its naval, naval staff. In other words, as the English would say, it's dog's body. <laughs> Indeed, he forthrightly confessed to his stepmother at the beginning of January 1850, quote, I'm much worried and feel ill and depressed. All of this is disagreeable, but no doubt must have an end one way or another. I never passed so miserable a life as I've done during the last year, end quote. A few days later, he was even more explicit. Quote, it is impossible to get on with so much business and worry, and there must be a change. Lord John Hay, quote, end quote. Lord John Hay being on the verge of stepping down, Milne wrote bluntly to the first Lord Baring that, quote, a more equal division of the duties must be made, for I will not make a slave of myself as I have done, end quote. His words evidently carried weight, for on Hayes' departure early the following month, Baring selected Captain Houston Stewart to replace him. True, Stewart was briefly a liberal MP in March, February, March 1852, but two years earlier, he was chosen on, chosen on the basis of his professional administrative experience, having been Captain Superintendent aboard at Stark Yard in 1846 and Controller General of the Coast Guard from November 1846 until his appointment to the Admiral. Furthermore, from this point forward, there were, almost without exception, at least two good working lords on the Board of Admirals. Furthermore, the practice of choosing working lords gradually extended beyond the junior most naval members. By the late 1850s and early 1860s, Lord Palmerston's Whig liberal governments employed first Richard Saunders, Sanders Dundas, and after he died in office, Sir Frederick Gray's first naval lords, both admittedly had immaculate political aristocratic pedigrees, but both had also acquired formidable reputations as, as administrators. Milne himself served as first naval lord in the 1866-68 conservative government, and more significantly returned to the board as first naval lord in 1872 under liberal auspices and was retained by the conservatives in 1874 after they won the general election of that year. Thus, by the latter date, the post of senior naval advisor was regarded by both political parties as being above politics. Their matters remained for almost two decades, although a couple of political admirals managed to survive. One was another Lord John Hay, a nephew of the one who had been in the Admiralty in the late 40s and early 50s. The former lacked the meddlesome traits of his namesake, but although a competent officer, his career path, his career path was smoothed by his weak liberal at connections. He himself was an MP, in the late 50s and again in the late 60s and early 70s. Far more meddlesome and portentous for the, the I've got to say it anyway, the repoliticization of the Admiralty was Captain Lord Charles Beresford, another MP who was appointed junior Lord, Naval Lord in 1886 at the urging of the Prince of Wales and over the reservations of incoming Prime Minister Lord Salisbury, who later characterized Beresford, quote, as an officer of great ability, but too greedy of popular applause to get on in a public department. He is constantly playing his own game at the expense of his colleagues. End quote. Playing his own game was indeed what Beresford was doing. He resigned from the board in 1888, ostensibly over salary cuts to the members of the Naval Intelligence Department. In retrospect, the stated reason appears to have been a pretext. In reality, he objected to myriad aspects of the Admiralty's policies and structures. As Paul Halpern writes in Beresford's ODNB entry, quote, he was a difficult colleague and early showed himself hostile to the policy of the board. He criticized the shipbuilding program and the organization of pay of the intelligence party department and, object, and objected to the supreme authority of the first naval lord in naval administration. Beresford's last objection brings us to the nub of the matter, for he, like many off naval officers, several journalists, 
and more than a few mostly conservative MPs maintained that a civilian under the Treasury sway could not oversee the Navy competently or provide what, for what he regarded as the proper level of naval preparedness in terms of ships, men, and war plans. Matters for which he argued that professional assessments should trump all other considerations. What was therefore needed was that naval professionals' judgment on the service's material, personnel, and planning requirements should overrule any objection from the Treasury. Such a scheme was an anathema to those who regarded civilian control as a sine qua non of the British constitutional system. It was also, judging by their acquiescence to civilian control, if not an anathema, then certainly not an issue over which to resign to any of the first naval lords of the 60s, 70s, or 80s. Mill and Arthur Hood, first naval lord at the end of the 80s, uh, exemplified the unquestioning acceptance of civilian control and the political neutrality that exemplified true naval professionals in Britain. Milne, indeed, refused to vote in parliamentary elections even after the secret ballot was introduced in 1872, such was his desire to appear nonpartisan. Two examples of the professional ethos will suffice. In 1874, Milne addressed a memorandum to First Lord George J. Goshen calling for an ambitious unarmored shipbuilding program for trade protection purposes, a priority of Milne's. Goshen's reply was unequivocal to the point of bluntness. To be presented, quote, with a proposition to build 24 corvettes and sloops is utterly out of the question. No government could do it, end quote. Furthermore, the program Milne sought was, quote, one which I could not contemplate in time of peace with our chief naval rival, France, that is, disabled by its defeat at the hands of Germany, and, quote, doing very little, and which, if I did contemplate, I could not carry with either with the House of Commons or with the government. No evidence exists that Milne tried to test press his point with Goshen. As for Hood, he faced often hostile questioning by Navalist members of an 1888 House of Commons Select Committee on the Navy Estimates. The grilling evident, uh, eventually grew so hectoring that Hood's testimony clearly re reflected his irritation and frustration. When pressed repeatedly by one committee member on whether any statement of the Navy's needs was prepared independent of financial considerations, Hood's exasperation was palpable. Quote, as I have stated before, a half dozen times, we looked at fulfilling the requirements of the service insofar as they could be provided for by the money from which expenses were to be met, end quote. Then when his questioner injudiciously followed up that question, on what ba by asking, on what basis does the First Lord tell you how much money he can afford? Hood indicated Lord George Hamill as the First Lord's presence as a member of the committee and shot back, there is the First Lord and he can answer that question. <laughs> Asked by another committee if he thought that the requirements of the Navy demand that more money should be spent than at present, Hood replied, that is a political question altogether for the cabinet to consider. In sum, he and Milne both fully, and I believe rightly, recognized the board's subordination to civilian authority. The naval members of the board could and did represent their views on the needs of the Navy and of its adequacy or want thereof, but they could only advise, not dictate. The proper strength of the Navy was ultimately not solely a professional matter, no matter how valuable professional assessments of it were. Beresford disagreed stridently and following his resignation, launched a public campaign to browbeat the Navy into accepting some, if not all, of his demands. Foremost amongst them was a large, indeed unprecedented, peacetime addition to the Navy's strength. But while he and his co-conspirators certainly sought more money for the service, they also sought to accomplish something far more reaching, far more far-reaching, to overhaul the process by which naval policy, in particular ship design and procurement, was formulated by the government. The 1888-1889 uh, Navy scare that Beresford launched was not the first instance in which naval officers had deliberately enlisted press and public opinion to voice their views upon a reluctant ministry. A few years earlier, muckraking journalist William T. Stead had drawn on not especially reliable information, probably supplied by First Naval Lord Ashley Cooper T., and certainly supplied by up and coming Sir John A. Fisher, a captain for his notorious truth about the Navy by one who notes the fact series in the Paul Mall Gazette. 
But neither Keene nor Fisher nor any other officer who might have been amongst Stead's informants had played a public role in the pressure campaign. Instead, they formed an anonymous collective characterized by him as the one who, quote, knew the facts, end quote. 1888, therefore, witnessed a novel. Even in Britain, the anomalous constitutional system of which permitted officers on the active list simultaneously to be politicians. Because as Beresford and his co-conspirators, most notably Admiral Lefleet Jeffrey Fitz Hornby, realized, there was no formal prohibition against officers on the active list publicly criticizing the state of the Navy, and by extension, publicly criticizing the government then in power. In the recent past, such officers had refrained from this unseemly practice. The Beresford's and Hornby's disregard for decorum, niceties, and conventions, although perhaps not as boundless as Donald Trump's, to transgress the unwritten rules that hitherto had kept officers from crossing this line. They reached out to the press, they held public meetings, they denounced the state of the Navy in parliamentary speeches, and they appealed directly to business groups and leaders to add their voices to the chorus. And they seemed to have achieved what they set out to do. In 1889, Lord George Hamilton brought forth a naval defense bill that called for this, this con the construction of no less than 10 battleships, 42 cruisers, and almost 40 smaller vessels. It duly passed, and as the Naval Defense Act authorized and funded no less than 21 million over five years, the largest peacetime shipbuilding program in the country's history. It also formally committed the Britain to the maintenance of the two power Stanford, standard. That is, the size of the Royal Navy's battle fleet should be equal to or superior to those of the next two worlds, the world's next two navies combined. Ironically, however, as an MP, Lord Charles Beresford strenuously objected to the Naval Defense Bill, claiming that he knew 21 million is not half enough to spend on the Navy, and what the government ought to do is tell the people so. His objection highlights what the Navalists did not achieve, or perhaps it would be better to say what they appeared not to have achieved. Beresford and others, both before and after him, sought to refashion Naval administration so that the professional element was dominant over the civilian, not only the, at the, on the board, but at the Treasury as well. This desideratum was a step too far, several steps too far, in fact, for the political world to count. And yet 1889 did mark a sea change in the formulation of the Navy's shipbuilding policy because it marked the prioritization of professional opinion over Treasury control, even though the constitution of the Admiralty remained unchanged. For most of the period 1815-1889, economic considerations had trumped professional appraisals in deliberations over naval policy, above all shipbuilding and procurement. After the Naval Defense Act, however, the positions were reversed, and so they would remain until the aftermath of the First World War. Why? To be sure, domestic political pressure of the sort brought by Beresford was important, but in addition, by the early, 1890, uh, the early 1890s, the naval lords had figured out how to oppose their will, not only on the civilian first lord, but on the government as a whole, simply to threaten to resign en masse, and by implication, go public with their case if they did not get in the way. This was precisely what happened with the Navy scare of 1893-94, which resulted in the so-called Spencer program. The naval lord first convinced first lord Earl Spencer that their calculations of French and Russian naval strength was accurate, besides it wasn't. <laughs> and when critical members of the cabinet, Chancellor of the Exchequer Sir William Harcourt and Prime Minister William Gladstone objected to the shipbuilding, pro shipbuilding program they demanded, they threatened to tender their resignations. Arthur Martyr casually remarks that, quote, the Sea Lords threatened to resign, end quote, if no large increase were announced in the House of Commons by Gladstone's liberal government. And Sir John Fisher, at that time third lord and controller, late, later wrote, quote, Sir Frederick Rogers, the first naval lord, and myself, in a nice quite wide way, not quite point blank, intimated that the sea lords would resign, end quote, if they did not get their way. This contretemps, as is widely known, led to Gladstone's final resignation from the prime ministership. Less well known is his comment to Algernon, Algernon West, his private secretary, who reported, recorded in his diary that on Gladstone told him on the 11th of January, 1894, quote, it is the admirals that have got their knife in me, end quote. As Paul Smith observes, quote, once the centrality of the na to the national interest of a Navy built to a two-power standard became a bipartisan assumption, 
The First Lord easily turned into a spokesman of the Admirals and the Admiralty into a near independent power within the government as a whole. It is essential to emphasize that this situation probably only obtained because of what Arthur Martyr called the spirit of the age. For without widespread navalism, the belief that a country's and empire's security and destiny were dependent on a power naval, powerful navy, the naval lords almost certainly would not have been able to exert the leverage that they did. And the navalism so apparent in Britain, as well as Germany and the United States and Japan, was quite specific to the period 1890-1914. Owing to the potent, I'm tempted to say toxic, combination of growing industrial comp competition, coupled with rabid nationalism, coupled with social Darwinism, coupled with jingoistic imperialism, and coupled with rampant militarism. Mahan's influence of sea power upon history volumes were likewise very important in convincing the British public that naval preponderance was essential to the country's security and to its status as a global power. And in 1894, the establishment of a lobbying organization, the Navy League, symbolized the change that had taken place in the previous half dozen years. John Fisher, thanks to his assiduous cultivation of leading politicians in the press, techniques that he had first employed in the Stead process and refined during the 1890s and early 20th century, was able to build upon these robust foundations during his initial tenure as first Naval Lord from 1904 to 1910. The Naval Lord, Richards and Fisher most prominently were thus the beneficiaries, beneficiaries of these external factors. Without them, they would not have been able to repoliticize the Board of Admiralty, albeit in a different, very different manner from that which had obtained in the 18, up to the 1850s. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. Can everybody hear me? John Mutchum, can you give me a thumbs up? Yeah, we're good. Outstanding. Okay, I'm going to read uh, Greg's paper, which is entitled Maritime Power and Diplomacy, the Role of Ambassador Sir Robert Craigie's Perception of Maritime Power and the Containment and Deterrence of Japan, 1937-1942. I'm going to read an excerpt of this paper. The study of the use of deterrence as a strategic concept employed by Great Britain has traditionally been associated almost entirely with the Cold War and the use of nuclear weapons within a containment strategy context. Therefore, like the concept of containment, deterrence has not been assessed rigorously as a viable strategic tool within the conventional conflict spectrum. This is particularly the case when those strategic objectives are looked at in association with maritime power and the strategy of economic warfare. Furthermore, the use of empirical historical analysis as the means of providing that assessment has also been absent from considerations regarding the utility of deterrence in the modern international security environment. This paper will focus on the British attempt to contain and then deter Japan through the use of maritime power in the period from 1937 to 1942 in association with diplomacy. It will demonstrate that without the required hard power elements of naval power, maritime power in association with diplomacy was not an adequate way in which to support the coercive aspect of economic warfare, which could create a viable deterrent effect. The historical lens to be used in analyzing this nexus of actions will be the role and impact of the British ambassador to Japan, Sir Robert L. Craigie. As ambassador to Japan, and given his close attention association with maritime power and all its attributes throughout his career, how Craigie did or did not manage to successfully use maritime power to contain and then deter Japan from threatening or seizing British interests in the Far East is a particularly instructive tale of how diplomats can and cannot use the attributes of maritime power to create strategic effects. Sir Robert Craigie was undoubtedly one of the few British diplomats of the interwar period who could rightfully be classified as a naval expert. As a junior foreign office official during the First World War, he worked in the world's most sophisticated blockade machinery designed to wage global maritime economic warfare against Germany and her allies. As head of the FO's American department, and lead British naval disarmament negotiator during the London Conference of 1935, Craigie's intimate knowledge of not only Britain's naval condition, but that of the United States and Japan, gave him enormous strengths upon appointment as His Majesty's Ambassador to Japan in 1937. As a reward for his work during the London Naval Conference, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain appointed Craigie to the ambassador's post in Tokyo in the hope that Craigie's deep naval knowledge and negotiating skills would find a solution to Britain's growing problem of strained relations with Japan. As 1940 drew to a close, 
Craigie's input into British considerations regarding the use of naval power in the Far East had become less influential. One reason was the stark reality that there was little naval power to spare that could assist his diplomatic efforts. In November 1940, the Far Eastern Committee appreciation of the situation in the Far East reflected Craigie's calls for a more substantial naval presence to deter Japan from making any unwise choices against Britain's possessions in the region. However, the reality of the situation was that, quote, our naval weakness in the Far East remains without remedy or visible sign of remedy. Whether the time has not come to augment our naval forces in that part of the world by dispatch of one or two capital ships, end quote. The arguments that the ambassador in Tokyo had made were acknowledged in London, but the management of those issues had now moved to British representatives in Washington and in China. On matters of how and why naval forces would be used in the Far East, the need to stay in step with the United States was now an absolute imperative, not a possible course of action. The need to not only coordinate considerations of the use of combined naval forces, but the linkage of those forces to the increasing economic pressure being applied by Britain and the United States throughout 1941, meant that the Washington-London access was the critical factor for coordinating diplomacy, economics, and naval power to deter Japan. For that reason, Craigie's voice became less important throughout 1941. One significant maritime incident that year highlighted the disconnect that existed between London and its views on how Anglo-American maritime power should work against Japan and Admiral Ambassador Craigie's. At stake was the integrity of the British blockade system itself. Multiple issues were interwoven. Could the British blockade deal effectively with Japan's attempts to continue to have access to German goods and technology, as well as to deny Germany war materials from Japan? Could Britain impose restrictions on Japanese shipping without escalating tension in the Far East? And finally, if some sort of accommodation was to be made with the Japanese over shipping matters in order to prevent a worsening of the British global strategic position, would the Americans accept the rationale for such actions or simply brand the British as appeasers, an outcome that was sure to weaken the Anglo-American strategic relationship aimed at containing and deterring Japan? The Asakamaru was a 7,000-ton armed Japanese merchant cruiser. On the 16th of January, 1941, it left Japan bound for Lisbon. On board were 30 members of a Japanese naval mission headed to Germany. As well, British intelligence was sure that the ship would take 3,000 tons of machinery and other items for the Japanese Navy, including guns from a factory in Switzerland. The question arose as to whether or not the ship should or could be intercepted. If the ship was indeed carrying cargo, then it ceased to be a warship, the designation that the Japanese Navy gave to it. Ambassador Craigie was instructed to let the Japanese authorities know that if the ship did indeed carry cargo and was therefore no longer a warship, it could be considered a target for interception under the British rules of contraband control. He was also asked for his opinion as to the likely reaction of the Japanese if the ship was indeed intercepted. The British ambassador to Japan did not, however, carry out the instructions as sent to him. Craigie believed that there was no doubt that the interception of the Asakamaru would have serious consequences and escalate the tension between the two nations. He advised that it would do no good to attempt to engage with the Japanese government and the Japanese Navy on the interception question, and that other methods of retaliating against the Japanese needed to be found. He acknowledged that if the Asakamaru were allowed to fulfill its mission, then the Japanese Navy would be encouraged to employ the same method on an increased scale. As an alternative, he recommended that he be allowed to large a formal protest with the Japanese Ministry for Foreign Affairs and attempt to persuade them to reverse the decision to send the ships on its mission, leaving no doubt in the Japanese government mind that the Royal Navy was duty-bound to intercept the ship if it did proceed with its voyage. In the mind of the Ministry of Economic Warfare, any such escalation in Japan's willingness to test the resolve of the British government and Royal Navy to enforce the rules of interception and blockade that underpinned the British trade restriction system was unacceptable. They argued that the ship had to be intercepted if it persisted, not only for the message that needed to be sent to Japan, but also to South American states who would want similar access to German goods based on the Japanese precedent. The MEW, the Ministry of Economic Warfare, now took control of the situation and, and of de facto Anglo-Japanese diplomatic relations concerning the blockade issue. They instructed Admiral Craigie to inform the Japanese that, quote, 
In view of the Japanese statement that the ship will be carrying cargo from Lisbon, His Majesty's government cannot regard her as immune from control and must insist on the normal proof that the cargo is not of enemy origin. That is to say that it should be covered by certificates of origin and interest issued by His Majesty's consular officers. As the Japanese government are aware, His Majesty's government only permitted the shipment of certain goods in the Nagara Maru on condition that no further enemy exports were shipped. To this decision, His Majesty's government must adhere, and if good of, en- if good of enemy origin are placed on board, they must reserve their right to intercept the ship, seize the goods, and place them in prize, end quote. As the demands on Great Britain's sea lines of communication became more critical to the overall war effort, and the need to control the seas effectively an absolute imperative, rather than a theoretical aspiration, control over the use of naval power in the Far East had moved from the periphery to the center, with now London firmly in charge of the matter. Questions of tactics and the appreciation of the levels of antagonism which marine deterrence activities could potentially arise in the Japanese transitioned from being Craigie's purview to the various military commanders-in-chief in the Far East, particularly the commander-in-chiefs of the Far East, Air Marshal Sir Robert Brooke Popham, and the, Air, and the Chief of China, uh, Air Vice Marshal Sir Geoffrey Layton. At the end of July 1941, after the Japanese seizure of air bases and other military facilities in Indochina, the Dominion's office asked Brooke Popham what further defensive measures could be taken in Malaya to counter the latest Japanese ex- expansionary actions. His response, to remove Japanese nationals from key defense areas such as Kedah, Faril, Province Wellesley, Penang, and the northern part of Perak, as well as Johor, in conjunction with closing the Japanese-owned iron ore mine in Kelantan, would provide a greater degree of local tactical security in the face of rising tensions. It would also, however, have a strategic effect in that along with the restrictions on Japanese shipping facilities already being enforced, the closure of the mine would reduce Japan's importations of Malaysian iron ore by 60%. Vice Admiral Layton had suggested, quote, an even more drastic measure, end quote, advising an even greater curtailment of Japanese shipping movements and facilities in Malaya, quote, prohibition of all traffic of tugs and lighters between harbor mouths and foreign ships at anchor or harbor, or prohibition of loading of foreign ships if more than one is either at anchor or in sight, close quote. After reflecting on the suggested courses of action and consulting around the various departments such as the Foreign Office, the War Office, the Admiralty, and the Ministry of Economic Warfare, the British government approved Brooke Propham's suggestion, but viewed Leighton's advice as, quote, going somewhat beyond what is warranted at the present moment, end quote, retaining the right, however, to introduce them in the future if further Japanese action warranted a response. Craigie's remaining tenure as Great Britain's ambassador was clearly now of limited influence where maritime matters were concerned, as the growing wartime machinery of British strategic decision-making process grew to meet the realities of war. Sir Robert Craigie's experience as the British ambassador to Japan reveals a man who understood the constituent parts of naval power in terms of the respective power of the Japanese, British, and American fleets in the Far East. It also demonstrates the limitations put on a diplomat to influence Japan in terms of instilling the belief in credible deterrence or containment due to not having the luxury of the persistent presence of dominant naval power in support of diplomatic pressure. Undoubtedly, in terms of having the diplomatic straw created by real as opposed to potential naval power to make coercive bricks that would limit Japanese aspirations in the region, Craigie worked at a distinct disadvantage. Nevertheless, after 1939, the increased potential for combined and coordinated Anglo-American maritime pressure to be a significant factor in deterring Japan was something that the ambassador was reluctant to use to full effect. British Far Eastern strategic policy was prominently made in terms of advice from Washington and China as the British need for American assistance to protect its Far Eastern interests became absolute. Despite that reality, Craigie continued to persist in thinking in terms of appeasing Japan instead of deterring it through the use of that vision of combined Anglo-American maritime power being a legitimate threat to Japanese expansionism. Continually pressed by the Foreign Office to take such a line and not be tempted to placate Japan in any way that would endanger the American belief in the resolve of Great Britain to stand firm against Japanese aggression in China, Craigie was in fact a man on the outside of the inner circle of British Far Eastern maritime strategic thinking. His career highlights the importance of diplomats needing to not only understand the core capabilities of Jeffrey Lay- of excuse me of naval power, 
but indeed the linkage of those capabilities to the higher maritime power attributes that can be used for effective deterrence and containment strategies. Most importantly, however, it reveals the absolute need to be able to effectively appreciate the political alliance and coalition context that a multi-actor strategic condition demands when the application of maritime power to deter, contain, and coerce is at issue. Thank you. Jesse, the floor is yours. Uh, Thanks for the applause. I've been reading on my own for 30 years now. Thanks. <laughs> That's tough to follow. Um, yeah, a, a couple of caveats before I start. The first is that according to the program, I have an appointment at Christopher Newport University, which is wonderful news. <laughs> I'm going to send them my expense report um, after I leave, but uh, the, currently at, at Duquesne. Um, and the other is that if I look down at my phone and sprint out of the room at some point, it's not only because I'm having some kind of intellectual crisis, but it's also because my wife has gone into labor. So it's, oh, wow. it's, been, a, it's been an interesting month. But anyway, uh, so that's just a, a, a preemptive sort of warning there. Um, so among the early 20th century's many epochal dates, consider 1922. After the chaos of the Great War and the flu pandemic, the world's diplomats were busy trying to create the new world that was promised, a world of peace and multilateralism. After the drama of Versailles and Paris, it didn't take long for the limitations of this new world to emerge. By 1922, the March on Rome, the Irish Civil War, the Shannak Crisis in post-Ottoman Turkey were all reminders of how the war had not really ended, so to speak, in greater Europe. The collapse of the Siberian intervention against the Soviets, the continued conflict between various warring factions in China, and the assassination of Japan's prime minister highlighted also the instability of East Asia. President Harding's call for a conference in Washington was itself designed to fill a void in the international system that the United States, the world's ascendant great power, had vacated by not assenting to the League of Nations. In 1922, the Washington Conference sorry, 1922, and the Washington Conference that kicked it off, was a pivotal moment in the frenetic great power competition of this early century, one that bears many similarities to our own. And the British Empire is a hard case in this moment of great power competition. It was neither obviously rising like the United States or Japan, nor defeated and prostrate like Germany. It was not new like the Soviet Union. It exited the war years victorious but decimated, sovereign over more territory and more debt than ever before. And its colonies were also reeling from rapid change, emerging from the Great War with new identities, priorities, and liabilities. The Treaty of Versailles and a host of other agreements since bore the distinctive signatures of a few of them, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and India. As it so often has been, sea power was at the heart of this moment in British history. Sea power served as a sort of index of these new conditions within the empire and among its parts, and between the empire and its great power competitors. The Five Power Treaty agreed at Washington is perhaps the starkest such index in history, and its elegant ratio, that five to five to three, advertising the new hierarchy of international relations and confirming that the Royal Navy's once famous two power standard had slid to a rather desperate parody with the Americans, concealed much in its numerical simplicity. And as many of us have, have written, it concealed a great deal by way of technology and armaments in that number, so much did its tonnage limits exclude. But it also concealed much politically, especially in Britain's share in that number five. Funding, building, crewing, and commanding the Royal Navy and its Dominion Associates by 1922 had become a massive exercise in coalition management. Decades of bargaining, strategizing, and planning had produced a few good ideas and many bad ones, and a great deal of constitutional and strategic confusion, but just enough coherence to keep the empire afloat through the worst war in history. So in the remainder of my time, I'll say a bit about what the Washington Conference meant for the British Dominions and to a lesser extent, India. Their role in this drama is important as a crucial chapter in the story of British decline, 
as a failed example of grand strategy prefiguring the Pacific War, and as a cautionary example of coalition management in the midst of brutal great power competition, again, not unlike the kind we face today. And the relevance of this history was thrown into relief last week in a complicated marketing operation for my paper, apparently, um, with the announcement of the new AUKUS Joint Naval Partnership in the Pacific, which is itself, and you know, we can talk for hours about this in the Q&A or maybe afterwards, um, which is itself a sort of the latest in the long line of agreements that we're hoping to address Far Eastern questions that runs directly from Washington in 1922 to today and under, sort of underlines the looming importance of the Indo-Pacific for today's strategists and leaders and warfighters. This point about British decline is hardly original. Admiral Beatty argued it at the conference itself. Now we had somewhat different reasons for doing so than the ones that I'm interested in today. I'll look at this from a few different angles. From the lens of politics and political theory, Washington recreated conditions that Dominions and their predecessor colonies had long enjoyed. Conditions that incentivized them to free ride on the security provided by a hegemon and also to act in self-interested ways. From the historical sort of angle, Washington showed Dominion governments that Big ships were a questionable investment, both because their utility as weapons was being called into question by the Admiralty itself by 1922, and because they had a way of ending up as scrap in one way or another. And finally, through the lens of, of sort of identity and politics, Washington broke down the, the empire's grand experiment at crossing the, what W.B. Du Bois called the color line and its termination of the Anglo-Japanese alliance. And each of these strands sort of bespeaks the strategic delegitimization of Europe in the eyes of Dominion observers, which is also something I think sort of rhymes with the present. A reflection on the blood, this is a reflection on the bloodletting of the Western Front that had just occurred, an expectation that the next war would instead be over the future of the Pacific, and a belief colored by the rise of the United States that the Japanese could not be allies in that war, but in fact would be likely adversaries. There's been a lot of good work on the Washington Conference in recent years, um, and also a few good things on Dominion involvement as well. Duncan Redford's article on the Navy League explained that the debate within the, the debate within British navalism about Washington's implications for decline, and Ian McGibbon and Michael Fry have written important chapters on the Dominion's experiences of the conference back in earlier decade, decades. Um, and there was a, a, a great uh, volume on this by Eric Goldstein and John Maurer as well. There's also a useful body of scholarship on these topics from the angle of Japan, which is useful because it takes a sort of unabashedly Pacific focus on a question that's still fairly often viewed from a very Atlantic perspective. The two decades preceding the Washington Conference had seen rapid change in Britain's larger colonies and some unusual strategic departures to accompany them. As a select group of these colonies made the transition to dominion status and built the, uh, the diplomatic and military machinery commensurate with that status, they provoked constitutional and strategic questions that the British Empire lacked adequate and final answers for, even if it had tried and mostly avoided uh, trying to answer them for the better part of its century. The Imperial Conference System, the Committee of Imperial Defense, and strategic concepts like the Royal Navy's Fleet Unit Plan were attempts at flexible thinking to accommodate the rise of these protean states and to provide for their security in some way. The Great War stressed all of these solutions to the breaking point, especially the naval ones. If, as Carl Schmidt argued, sovereignty cons consists of that which prevails during states of exception or emergency, then the Royal Navy still very much had a kind of sovereignty in the form of central command over Imperial naval forces during the emergency that was the Great War. And it must be stated in any discussion of the adequacy of these systems that they served to win the war and to bring Dominion manpower and resources to bear in that victory, even if it was not as decisive at sea as many in the Admiralty had hoped. But the question of central command returned with a vengeance after the armistice. It was partially under these auspices uh, next slide, please. That Admiral Jellicoe departed for a tour of the Dominions after the armistice to report on questions of naval strategy. 
And his tour was interesting uh, in several ways. It produced some elegant thinking, uh, much of which was sort of dead on arrival due to his relationship with the Admiralty, which was sort of deteriorating. Jellicoe wrote, though, to Walter Long, the first Lord of the Admiralty at the time, that only by its emphasizing the strategic threat of Japan could the Pacific Dominions be convinced to spend adequate money on the Navy. Yet naval questions for fledgling Dominion governments went far beyond the rational calculus of security needs that were still expected to largely be met by Britain or tentatively in some imagined future, perhaps even the United States. Instead, as I've argued elsewhere, they often use military and naval assets and questions as political capital to pursue the goods of sovereign statehood. And some of those goods of sovereignty had already been obtained by the Dominions by 1922. They'd gained a foothold in the international community by emerging from the war as distinctive entities, if not wholly independent ones, in treaties and within organizations, for example. Contributing to collective security schemes in order to secure these trappings of sovereignty had been a hard fought political battle before the war and had carried a dearly bought price once that war began. Their governments and budding economies were anxious for a peace dividend and navies are expensive. Arthur Balfour, the former uh, prime minister and cabinet minister was tasked with leading the empire delegation in Washington. And there was a great panel this morning, a uh, paper by Louis Halewood about Balfour and his ideas of a sort of naval league. Um, in many ways, this paper is kind of a sequel to that that sort of picks up where Louis left off this morning. Um, he arrived, he, Balfour, arrived uh, in Washington with his own draft of proposal for settling the strategic questions of the Far East, including great powers respecting each other's interests and preserving the integrity of China. But his plan was to let the Americans do the proposing. Upon arriving in Canada, he was informed by his Dominion counterparts that the Americans were determined to sink Britain's alliance with Japan. And he had not predicted the intensity of the Americans' plans for arms limitation. And next slide, please. Enter the naval holiday proposed by U.S. Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes at the start of the Washington Conference. The holiday, which would halt capital ship construction for a period of 10 years, was designed to prevent another arms race like the one that had occurred before the Great War. And of course, the second order effect of this holiday was to save all the signatories huge sums of money, which was attractive to most of the civilian governments in question. It would also mean a decade of obsolescence on British vessels, already lagging their, their rivals in many ways in that regard, and allow, in the meantime, the skills of British workers and the capacities of British factories to atrophy in the process. For Dominion governments, whose naval flirtations with funding capital ships had mostly centered around two battle cruisers bearing the names Australia and New Zealand, those flirtations would end. This, this was so much the better for many of the Pacific-facing Dominions who had also resolved to focus their efforts on smaller vessels anyway. Admiral Beatty attached to the Empire delegation in Washington as the Royal Navy's technical voice, sounded the alarm about the consequences of Hughes' naval, naval holiday within his own delegation. In this, he had to overcome not just the American disarmament offensive, but also Robert Borden, the erstwhile Prime Minister of Canada and that Dominion's representative at the Empire delegation. Borden was determined to secure a deal that would bring the empire into cooperation with the United States, his neighbor. With him were George Pierce, the Australian delegate who served as the Home and Defense Ministers in the Commonwealth, and, remotely from London, David Lloyd George, who richly desired the naval holidays entailed cost savings. Borden even proposed periodic additional conferences that could indefinitely extend this holiday, perhaps foreclosing on naval races um, involving capital ships forever. Despite the Admiralty's reservations, however, and skepticism elsewhere in the Empire delegation, this holiday idea received British assent along with the other components of the Five Power Treaty. Turning to Canada, uh, next slide please. Canada represented by Borden and let, led at home by a succession of two prime ministers, culminating in Mackenzie King, was probably the conference's biggest winner in terms of it, among the Dominions in terms of their leaders' goals. In view of Canada's continuing alignment with the United States, it hoped for the end of Britain's alliance with Japan. 
which the Americans found unacceptable. Japanese-American rivalry, at least in theory, could bring Britain into war as Japan's ally against the Americans. This nightmare scenario motivated Canadian opposition to the Anglo-Japanese alliance and a desire for a new tripartite deal that would include the Americans. The Canadians wish, moreover, to bring the United States into council with the empire on international affairs, having failed to secure this via the League of Nations, which is a lot of what Louis was talking about this morning. Borden even hoped to institute a sort of grand international tribunal system that could stop war completely through arbitration, and which would rest on a foundation of Anglo-Saxon law and order, as it were, with the United States and the British world as its co-guarantors. Accepting Hughes's grand pronouncements about peace, then, was prerequisite to Borden's plans, whatever the Admiralty's objections. The Canadians had further geostrategic priorities that were out of step with the rest of the Empire delegations. They had a uniformly Atlantic priority set uh, at a conference dominated mostly by Pacific questions. Its government had long planned to defund Canada's fleet unit, which in its original form was intended to consist of a battle cruiser squadron based in British Columbia. And the Dominion had no need of powerful naval defenses in its own estimation in a theater so aggressively patrolled by the Americans in the future. Borden, in fact, felt that Balfour's draft agreement at Washington was too narrowly focused on the Pacific, which is rather an odd quibble for an agreement involving Japan. Such were Borden's differences that the Admiralty on accepting, so, sorry, such were Borden's differences with the Admiralty on accepting American proposals that he was eventually instructed via cable by the Canadian cabinet to avoid causing diplomatic embarrassment by creating fissures within the empire delegation. For a man who would become following in Wilfrid Laurier's trail, one of the foremost statesmen of the British Empire, this was a, a remarkable development that is, illustrates the intensity of his desire to forge an agreement with the United States. And this is the sort of thing that John's next book is about. This desire, along with the grim reality understood by most at the conference, uh, that the UK could not truly outbuild the United States in any theoretical naval race, gave Borden the edge he needed to overcome objections to a building freeze many knew would harm the Royal Navy in relative strength. Viewed from Ottawa, a freeze on capital ship construction was no great loss as the Dominion already meant to shelve plans to build a battle cruiser and focus on smaller vessels. In Michael Fry's turn of phrase, it would, quote, relinquish the right to construct that which it had no intention of constructing. For the Australasian Dominion, a primary concern of the conference was its implications for the Singapore strategy, which we heard a little bit about um, in a prior panel as well. The supposed framework for imperial security in the Far East had been outlined on a preliminary basis a few years earlier by Admiral Jellicoe after his tour of the region. The Singapore strategy was an attempt at resolving one of the old dilemmas of the fleet unit plan, at least a geographic one. How could Pacific Dominions contribute to an imperial fleet with its center of gravity in British waters and with a likely need to concentrate there in wartime? Its answer was that Singapore would serve as a sort of bulwark of the empire's eastern security with defenses resilient and forces strong enough to weather a regional attack until relieving forces would arrive from Britain. This plan had a number of tragic flaws, beginning with the wishful thinking that the Admiralty would be willing or able to spare forces from home waters in the event of a global contingency acute enough to entail a full-scale attack on British forces at Singapore, which Jellicoe called, quote, the naval key to the Far East, unquote. This fanciful assumption called into mind the doomed voyage of, Ru of Russia's Baltic Sea Fleet 15 years prior in the, Ru the Russo-Japanese War. And coincidentally, it was Japan, again, who served as the imagined foe in this scenario. Like the fleet unit plan before it, the Singapore strategy was imperfect, but had enough finesse to generate assent among the relevant parties. Australia, New Zealand, and India were paying into a multi-year scheme to fortify and defend it. Australia's position, meanwhile, on the Japanese alliance was much more complicated than Canada's. Its leaders felt much more threatened by Japanese expansion and also upheld a racist immigration policy designed to bar Japanese from settling in Australia, but they supported the alliance's renewal. At any rate, it had kept peace for 20 years. Billy Hughes, the Australian prime minister who had served in the Imperial War Cabinet, 
and in the delegation to the Paris Peace Conference, thought the four power pact, which is the one that was meant to uphold status quo in the Pacific, had merely traded the military certainty of the Japanese alliance for a set of flimsy agreements lumping in the Americans and the French. He said of this trade for Australia, quote, as against the substance, she has offered the shadow. The Australian position on arms limitation, meanwhile, had more in common with Canada's. Its government was more interested in funding its own naval force, but recognized that smaller vessels than the 10,000 ton and up capital ships and the treaty regulations fit its fiscal and strategic needs more closely. It would allow the Dominion to invest in submarine and anti-submarine vessels to counter regional threats, for example. And like most governments in the early 1920s, it was also keen to save money. But Australia was much closer to Japan's range of attack than other parts of the British Empire and had the added liability of a new league mandate in New Guinea to defend. So in place of the concreteness of the Japanese alliance, the battlecruiser HMAS Australia, or even the frame frameworks of either the fleet unit plan or the Singapore strategy, it was left for the Admiralty to sort of ask Australia to at least provide a local seagoing force that could coordinate with Royal Navy vessels in local waters to provide some subsidy for Singapore and to provide fuel oil facilities that would enable Royal vessels to refuel in Australian waters. In an Australian Council of Defense meeting the following year, Prime Minister Stanley Bruce said of even these aid agreements, quote, whether or not such help could be given is another matter. Sorry, next slide, please. Which is the last line on that document. Um, turning to New Zealand. New Zealand's strategic concerns were not drastically different than Australia's, being relatively isolated in the Pacific and with a, loot, a new league mandate in Western Samoa that extended its area of concern farther into that region. Like Australia, it also hoped to maintain the Japanese alliance that had averted a greater Pacific war for the last two decades, even if it feared Japanese expansionism in the, wrong, in the long run. Where it differed with its neighboring dominion was on how best to support the Imperial Navy which New Zealand had long preferred to do in more direct ways by subsidizing the Royal Navy and cooperating with a more centralized model of command. And it was this posture that had led to the Dominion's 1909 gift of 1.7 million pounds for the construction of the battlecruiser HMS New Zealand, which the government of New Zealand continued to pay down for decades after the fact. Admiral Jellicoe, after completing his tour and subsequent report on naval strategy for the region, had taken a post as the Dominion's Governor General in 1920, a position that kept him conveniently involved in imperial affairs, but also conveniently distant from the Admiralty with which he increasingly clashed. He was uncommonly active in this post as Governor General, commuting, communicating directly with London and providing extensive advice and input to Prime Minister William Massey's government on matters of, of security and international affairs. Jellicoe had also assisted in the organization of the New Zealand Division of the Royal Navy, which was formally constituted just before the Washington Conference. And its, com its command was structured along ma mainly pre-war lines legally and around uh, the light cruiser Chatham in terms of uh, its composition. This arrangement remained somewhat murky, but was at any rate clearer than prior ones, which had forces notionally defending New Zealand based variously in Australia, China, or simply tooling around in the North Sea. <laughs> Jellicoe's presence in New Zealand and his prior report colored that Dominion's assessment of the greater Pacific. He regarded Japan as the principal regional threat of the future, though Massey read this rather against the grain as reasons to uphold the Anglo-Japanese alliance. Next slide, please. Jellicoe's report said dryly of this situation, quote, Japan is the only nation in the Far East, except the United States, which would be in a position to inflict any permanent injury on the British Empire. I have, perhaps quite, not quite justifiably, omitted the United States in considering this problem. Massey and his representative in Washington, the judge Sir John Salmon, regarded the conference's outcomes as mildly deleterious to British interests, but worth supporting anyway. The Dominion government agreed to let Salmon affix his signature to the Four Power Treaty on New Zealand's behalf, a gesture that was commensurate with the evolution of the Dominion standing in the international community since the Great War. Yet, as Ian McGibbon has noted, this is a constitutionally murky gesture, and Salmon, as a legal scholar, knew it. Due to limited cipher capacities, in fact, for his delegation in Washington, the government in Wellington knew little of what was happening on a given day beyond what they heard 
of the Australian delegation's actions. So to conclude here, uh, oh yeah, this one will do. <laughs> the outcomes of the Washington Conference <laughs> for the British Dominions traded one type of confusion for another. Finally, rid of the Anglo-Japanese alliance, which they had accepted and even supported at times, but also doubted and feared, they welcomed the United States into formal bargaining over the Pacific future. But if the Dominions, for, region, for reasons of either strategic calculus and wishful thinking, or racial solidar solidarity, could be optimistic about future American intervention in the Pacific, they had to balance this against the Four Power Treaty's ban on American fortifications west of Hawaii. This left the British Empire, in the Admiralty's words, quote, the sole power to counter with naval forces any aggressive tendencies on the part of Japan, unquote. Meanwhile, Jellicoe's idea of the Singapore strategy, much like the fleet unit plan, was coherent enough in principle, if not in practice. Instead of getting the huge influx of cash it would have needed to actually work effectively, was hamstrung by the cost-cutting ramifications of the Washington agreements. The inaugural British labor, labor government, in fact, under Ramsay MacDonald, further eviscerated the plan in 1924 by slashing its metropolitan funding. Canada never paid into the scheme, though the government of India did. <laughs> this was merely the fitful beginning of a story that would end in arguably the worst military disaster in British history when Singapore fell to Japanese forces in a matter of days in 1942. Instead of emerging from the war with a new settlement that could underwrite the future of either imperial naval cooperation or the security of the greater Pacific, the British dominions continued evolving in the divergent directions they had begun to follow before the war. Canada moved further underneath the American security umbrella. Australia moved eventually into further freelancing. After Ramsay MacDonald cut funding for Singapore, the Commonwealth under Stanley Bruce responded by launching an aggressive five-year spending plan for its own naval forces. And New Zealand dutifully continued good faith, good faith efforts to subsidize more centrally directed admiralty plans for naval security. For other parts of the empire, especially South Africa and India, the principle of dominion recognition at naval conferences was more important than the naval affairs themselves. Jan Smuts, the South African politician in general who, become, who had become an imperial statesman and architect of the League of Nations, which John is also writing about a lot these days, was furious that the British dominions did not receive individual invitations to Washington. Srinivasa Sastri, a member of the Viceregal Council in India and a delegate to the Imperial Conference and the League of Nations, also attended at the Washington Conference as India's delegate. He regarded his presence as vital to India's development as a recognized member of the international community and to the rights of the Indian diaspora abroad. He wrote to his daughter, quote, India's advance can only be estimated by those who have the imagination to see the subtle ways in which political action is controlled by the convergent events of thought from different parts of the empire. The Washington Conference is a triumph of the world's public opinion. More and more every day in the future, England's policy will be molded by American and Dominion sentiment." Unquote. So 1922 was a year of events that revealed the new world the war had made, and the extent to which Sastry was right. As the Shinak crisis in Turkey had shown, even the principle of muddling through on vague consultation between Britain and the Dominions um, on conflict uh, could lead to disaster in the areas of foreign policy. The Washington agreements, while including and acknowledging Japan as a great partner, did so in a way that discreetly and mathematically inscribed their inferiority, playing into the hands of increasingly hawkish elements within Japan's military and naval establishment. It's far from clear that the new Pacific arrangement did as much to keep Japan an honest actor in the international system as the British alliance had, for example. In a symbol of the way the Washington agreements did not so much inaugurate a new era as end one, the Five Power Treaty was the death sentence of the two battle cruisers, New Zealand and Australia, and the years of politicking and financing that had brought them into being as symbols of those countries' naval futures and aspirations to sovereignty. Reacting strongly against plans to scrap the ships in utilitarian ways that might salvage or repurpose their value, Judge Salmon insisted they be scrapped in theatrical and significant ways, preferably in geographically relevant waters. In New Zealand's case, he failed. The ship was plundered for movable relics and turned into a hulk in the Firth of Forth. Australia, meanwhile, was scuttled off Sydney Heads in April 1924 
with an honor guard of British and Australian vessels. It would be unreasonable to expect anyone in the early 1920s to guess exactly what lay in store for the future of the Pacific in the coming decades. But one Australian letter writer managed to strike an appropriate tone of alarm. <laughs> Next slide, please. This is the final one. Um, in an anonymous note to the Commonwealth's Defense Minister E.K. Bowden on the morning Australia was scuttled, the grim writer warned, quote, the sinking of the Australia is an abomination in the sight of the Lord God. See thou do it not, lest thou never be returned to Parliament again. Thou mayest sell her or use her as a coal hulk for the Navy, but thou mayst not scuttle her. The Washington Treaty is an abomination unto me, saith the Lord God. Unquote. Thank you. John, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I uh, will start by thanking Mike for, for agreeing to chair our, our, our panel today, and thank you all for the attendance of the good crowd, um, uh, both online and in person. And so the interest of that, I'm going to uh, adopt a rather laissez-faire approach to commentary so that we can leave plenty of time for questions. Um, and I'm also acutely aware that I'm all that stands between you and a cocktail if you use that. <laughs> I'm also going to, uh, I think, decline to give commentary on Greg Kennedy's excellent paper, just since, since, since Greg's not here to respond, um, and since we just got a summary from, from Mike, I, I think I'll, I'll focus my comments on, on John Beeler and Jesse Cumberland's um, two very, very good papers. Uh, John's paper gives us a sort of chronological arc of the, let's see if I can say this, depoliticistic Nope. Nope. <laughs> Nobody can say it. The depoliticization and repoliticization, it's the mask, of the Admiralty using uh, uh, several prominent flag officers as case studies. And, and, and part of this narrative rests on the professionalization of the Admiralty uh, taking place in the mid Victorian Navy, of which, of course, John is, 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 is very well familiar. The old board in the era of the French Wars was largely limited policy making, and so it should come as no surprise that Tories installed Tories and Whigs installed Whigs. As, as John admit, quote, policy making was an inseparable, was and is inseparable from politics. The structural changes to the Board of Admiralty in the 1840s altered this picture. The abolishment, for example, of a separate logistical branches, uh, such as the Vittling Board, uh, endowed the Admiralty with a far larger portfolio of administrative responsibilities, as he reveals just solely through the use of, 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 of correspondence alone. Um, and so Admiralty appointments for flag officers became less of a medieval sinecure and more a post for talented professionals. John uses uh, his, 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 his prominent figure, Alexander Milne, as a, what he calls a poster child for this transformation of the Admiralty. So a Tory, and from a proud, long Tory background, Milne's talent and skill as an administrator inured him to politicians of all stripes, first stepping into the role as fourth naval, naval lord in John Russell's Whig administration. And let's face it, John Russell is arguably the most radical uh, uh, liberal politician of the 19th century. Or, sorry, prime minister. Um, others like Milne soon followed, helping to restore or remove this, this taint of party politics from the higher echelons of admiralty administration, at least lessening them. But this isn't the end of the story, as John points out. The rise of navalism in the 1880s initiated the gradual repoliticization of the Admiralty. And here John points to Charles Beresford as a classic example of a serving officer moonlighting as a popular who rather skillfully plays to partisan sensibilities and public hysteria. We, of course, uh, in, in the field of naval history, we're often, you know, sort of look at issues like the Barrister Fisher debates through the context of naval strategy. I think uh, uh, the rest of the historical discipline looks at these as actually two figures cut from the same sailor. Uh, this, this is just, these, are, these are types of individuals that are increasingly filling the higher echelon of the Admiralty. John questions why this process takes place, which is a topic I'm, I'm, I'm interested in as well. Um, and I, I certainly agree with this take that the transformation of the public sphere is, is at least partly responsible for this. Penny dreadful, the, what he calls the toxic mixture of industrial competition and rabid nationalism, of virulent racism, just to name a few. Um, I'm also interested, though, in the suggestion that, that this represents a quintessentially Victorian exercise in reinforcing civilian control of the Navy. 
Milne's refusal, and I'm not sure you shared this in your paper, this may have been uh, a, a footnote, but, but Milne's refusal to vote in parliamentary elections after the 1872 adoption of the, uh, uh, of the Australian secret ballot um, is, a fascina is as fascinating as it is, I think, for to our own modern sensibilities. But as John points out, quote, it exemplified the unquestioning acceptance of civilian control and the political neutrality that exemplified true naval professionals in Britain, end quote. Um, and at the same time, on the other side of that coin, Beresford and company's skillful appropriation of the naval debate in the 1880s and afterwards initiated a transformation that changes the scale of naval administration so that, as John says, quote, the professional element was dominant over the civilian. So given the broad trajectory of the atmosphere during this period, I'd love to hear John maybe expound a little more on what this suggests about the very nature of Royal Navy administration in the long 19th century. John's own work has, uh, has undercut the notion of the mid-Victorian um, Navy as the sort of dark ages of the Admiralty. Uh, but what exactly were, why exactly were the mid-Victorians so much more averse to taking on political roles than their Georgian predecessors or their Edwardian successors? Did the zeitgeist of mid-Victorian liberalism give way to something more fundamentally modern, perhaps? Um, how much did strategic consideration play a role in this sort of the 19th century being uh, uh, bookended, of course, by the Napoleonic Wars and the First World War. And finally, can we see in this depoliticization and repoliticization a sort of rise and fall narrative um, as we grapple with a better understanding of admiralty leadership in the long 19th century? Should we look at a figure like Milne as a return to normalcy or an aberration and a longer tradition of quintessentially political battles? Turning to Jesse then, Jesse looks at the relationship between uh, Imperial Defense, the Dominions, and the Washington Conference, um, correctly identifying this, this post-war period, 1921-22, uh, as, 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 a, as a crucible year, um, in which, of course, as he says, quote, sea power was at the heart of this moment in British history. For many observers at the time, the rise of the British Commonwealth offered a possible counterweight to the challenges of the 20th century, the rise of the United States, Soviet world power, Japanese ambitions in the Far East, etc. But the evolution of the Dominions, and in particular the evolution of the Dominion Navy, raised some pretty serious strategic and constitutional questions that proved to be a thorny matter in the broader fabric of imperial relations. Jesse looks to the Washington Conference as what he calls, quote, a failed example of grand strategy prefiguring the Pacific War and a cautionary example of coalition management in the midst of rural great power competition, not unlike, uh, not unlike we face today. And he shows, I think, uh, 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 quite successfully how, and this is important for those who want to kind of peel back the onion in dealing with, with issues of imperial defense, that the Dominions are not a monolithic entity when it comes to naval security, with Canada pursuing one set of policies, uh, chiefly orientation towards the United States, Pacific Dominions pursuing another, um, generally fear of imperial Japan, and South Africa, India, and, and, and ultimately the Irish Free State as well, just not wanting to pay for anything. Um, of central importance, though, for Jesse is this question of sovereignty. Um, surely the Dominions have, have uh, most notably Australia, of course, has maritime ambitions, but they also recognize that for better or for worse, they rely on a collective security guarantee provided by the Royal Navy, mostly in European waters. And so many an admiral, admiralty official uh, uh, explains lectures, if you will, to Dominion statesmen that a small local navy would quickly be swept aside if the Royal Navy ever loses control of European waters. But as Jesse explains, the Admiralty in the post-war era remains um, out of touch when dealing with Dominion policymakers, going so far as to encourage John Jellicoe to encourage the Pacific Dominions to end their experiment in local sea power and pay subsidies towards the Royal Navy. Um, my question, I think, would be, given all these circumstances, I, mean, I, I, I agree with Jesse's interpretation very much. I think we're quite in sync on this matter. Um, but one, one question that always comes back to me is, is, given these circumstances, one wonders what the alternative might have been, the specific dominions in particular. Um, I'm often quite shocked at the sort of highly romanticized ideas of what, specific, of what the dominions are capable of when it comes to imperial defense, going back to the Henderson Report of 1911, which you know, imagines this idea that by 1925, Australia will have a fleet of, of 10 dreadnoughts. 
1913 <laughs> that Robert Borden and Churchill are discussing the possibility of Canada fielding an entire battle crew, uh, dreadnought squadron, um, or even the Jellicoe Report itself in 1919, which advocated that much larger Dominion establishment. Let's keep in mind, folks, that, that Australia has a population in 1920 of about 4 million. Uh, 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 New Zealand, what roughly about a million. Um, that's that's about the size of Alabama and Mississippi combined in 1920. And one can imagine, you know, these states providing a battle cruiser squadron as part of the United States Navy establishment. And so, moreover, the the the, the, the as Jesse, I think, really the, the image that he provides at the beginning of HMS uh, of HMS New Zealand um, being scrapped, and of course at the end with the scuttling of HMS Australia, these ships are already approaching obsolescence by the Battle of Scotland. Um, given the rapid pace of naval technology uh, during the period, the, the, the serious concerns, I think, about investing in large capital ship projects, which will be out of date decades before they're actually paid off. Not, not unlike my 2015 Kia Optima. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I, again, I agree with Jesse that this portends a quote failed example of grand strategy, but I'd ask him to maybe explain a little further why this was the case. And I think maybe more importantly, who's at fault here? Um, is this an issue of a disconnect between admiralty and civilians, Britain and the Dominion, or some combination thereof? And finally, I, you know, if, if, if time permits, maybe Jess could expound a little bit more on his on his central thesis of this connection between sea power and sovereignty, which is which is uh, also at the heart of his, his very good book on this subject that came out this past year. Um, beyond that, Mike, I will turn it back over to you. <laughs> Okay, why don't we give our panelists a moment or two to respond, uh, and I worry we have about 25 minutes left, so if they could take a couple minutes so we leave some time for Q&A, and John, I may uh, lean on you to, to call for people in the audience, since uh, even though there's an owl in the room, I can't, I can't really see. So, John, you want to start with a response to John? Uh, yeah, very quickly, and this is multifaceted. First of all, John, thanks very much for your comments. Um, there's one sort of, how would I want to put it? One angle you could take to approach this is why do the governments of the period choose people like Richards and Fisher mm -hmm. when they could get more pliant people like oh, Lord Walter Kerr, for instance? It's not that he isn't a reformer. It's not that he isn't a modernizer. It's not that the Navy estimates don't increase. But he's not the kind of person who's going to, you know, force a showdown with the government either. You know, Francis Bridgman is another one of these, you know. I think these guys appreciate the supremacy of civilian judgment. And, you know, in Kerr's case, he's fortunate to have Selborne, who both pretty much agrees with him. Um, but something, there is something about the personnel choices that particular governments can make. Okay, that's a factor. Um, with Milne and Aberration, um, if you compare him to the later 19th century or arguably to the earlier 19th century, yes, in some ways he is. Um, he's not in terms of his professionalization but because people like Fisher and Richards are thoroughgoing professionals from the North. They're good at administering the Navy. In fact, they're from a civilian standpoint, they're perhaps too good at administering the Navy. But if you compare Milne, for instance, to the interwar period, when civilian and treasury control has been reasserted, and you find, you know, even fairly staunch navalists like David B find find themselves fighting rearguard actions. And I will leave people like James to speak to this period who are more far more conversant with it than I am. But the spirit of the age has changed too. Mm -hmm. You know, as a consequence of World War One, as a consequence of the, blood, of the bloodbath of World War One, gone is the rampant militarism. Gone to a large extent is the navalism. Uh, the jingoistic imperialism isn't completely gone. There is Winston Churchill, after all, but it is to some extent much more muted. Um, the social Darwinism is not gone either, but there are a lot of people who are questioning those assumptions in a way that they, not many people, okay, John Atkins and Hobson had questioned it, but not many others have questioned it in the pre-war period. Uh, a lot rests on the determination of the governments of the period to impose their will on the admiralty. Uh, and I 
think I have was about I all that I thought of to reply to your questions, and I'm sure I've left some of them out <laughs> along the way. I can't think of that fast anymore. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, just a couple of brief thoughts about this sort of sea power and sovereignty thing. And I think one of the ways that, one of the things that throws this into relief is looking at the principle of naval subsidy. And because, I mean, the central strategic problem for most of these dominions is unsolvable without a hegemonic partner. And that's Britain for most of history. And then at the turn of the 20th century, it gets very uncomfortable, especially during the war years in which that hegemonic partner is mostly Japan. I mean, you can chase Fon Shpei around the Pacific as, as much as you would like, but you're still relying on Japanese support to convoy troops and things like this. And in the future, everyone's cognizant that this very well could be the United States, but you can't do this alone. And so that raises questions about how you procure that support. And what's interesting about, about subsidies and the way they fit into this is that subsidies are the cheapest and simplest way to procure that partnership. If that's really the goal, then all you need to do is just pay that subsidy and go home. But there's huge opposition to doing that for most places in the empire, except kind of New Zealand. And so the question then is why, at least for me anyway. And I think that question shows how the rational calculus of security often goes beyond these material questions and goes into these political ones, right? And, yeah. and, and, and that's where the gap has to get made up. On, on the issue of um, you know, what are they supposed to do here, which is a very legitimate um, question, which I fear I am ill-equipped to finally solve here in this room for us today. <laughs> Um, you know, I guess the big question that, that one would ask counterfactually is the question about Japan. You know, what do you do with the Anglo-Japanese alliance? Do you try to renew it and keep it struggling onward as a thing that buys peace in the Pacific? Or do you jettison it and, and, and fall into the arms of the United States? And, and, and I don't, I am not qualified necessarily to answer that question and how it would go differently. I mean, I, I had a great panel about war gaming. Uh, We'll, that, we'll, you know, we'll model this. After sure, that. sure. Yeah. But I mean, so a, a brief thought about it, though, is that I can imagine in this counterfactual, for example, you try to renew the Anglo-Japanese alliance, and probably what happens is that you lose Canada. Either out of the empire or in some less drastic way, you see a Canadian alignment with the, with the United States that just gets out of that sort of coalition altogether, because it, this is untenable for the government of Canada going forward. And I think that this, this question is interesting when you look at what's going on today in the Pacific and, and the way people have responded to this new agreement. I mean, I haven't looked at the news in the past 12 hours, but it seems like so far Justin Trudeau had been the most cool about sort of affirming what had happened here. And you still see like very similar questions being played out, and especially with regards to Australia. And they have this rich history of realpolitik, so to speak, in naval strategy that connects today to this moment and beyond. Um, and I think it kind of highlights the way that a lot of these questions are still open and, and, and unanswered um, today. Uh, Mike, if, if uh, you want to monitor any online questions that come up, because I can't see that over uh, my left hand side, and then I'll take care of the ones in the room. Yes, I will do that if you want to take care of the ones in the room. I don't think I see anybody online yet. So um, okay. why don't you go uh, ahead if there's someone to... in the room? Yeah, maybe if you'll, if you'll identify yourself uh, with the question. Uh, I'm Corbin Williamson. I work at Airwork College. Uh, thanks for all the great papers. Question, question for Jesse. Um, in terms of this question of sovereignty, kind of one of the most basic elements of sovereignty is the ability to command one of those ships. Right, and so in the period you're looking at, the 20s, 30s, and the start of World War II, um, what's the arrangement? So, like when Britain goes to war in 39, are H and A S ships automatically at war, or is a separate declaration required from Canberra to move them under operational control of the Admiralty? Yeah, yeah. Um, I should say too that the closer we get to World War II, the less my knowledge obtains, and there might be someone else in the room who can <laughs> speak in a more detailed way. But as of the time we're in, in the 20s. This question is still, I mean, there are legal realities operating about, um, you know, proximity to littoral waters and blue water things and all of that, but they, they become 
concretized very quickly in the moment of of war, and that was the case in 1914 too. There was there were all of these sort of baroque agreements put into place at successive imperial conferences about the transfer of command, for example, from a Dominion navy to the to the Admiralty by vote of the New Zealand House of Representatives, for example, that never occurred. You know, and so the reason I cited Schmidt, which seems to be like a more and more popular thing these days um, to do, is that he's the theorist of sovereignty who's most interested in these moments when rules break down, right? And so I think, you know, the, the maybe not the most precise, but the most accurate answer to your, to your question is that the abstraction of the differences between these notions of central command um, is like radically obviated in these moments of crisis in which central command is just reverted to. Um, and that's definitely the case in, in, in the First World War. And it, it remains the case really um, in, in, in 1922. In these moments when, for example, New Zealand is trying to constitute its own division of the Royal Navy, they're still trying to hash out these moments of, of saying like, well, we will make a motion of assent that transfers command, um, but nobody on the ground actually believes that this is going to be the case. But I mean, at the same time that this is happening in Turkey, the Dominions are effectively vetoing British foreign policy by saying, no, we will not go to war. Um, and so this is right in that liminal space, I think, when this reality of sovereignty is, is, is changing. Just for the heck of it, Canada's the Canadians are going to come into the war, but the Parliament officially votes to go to war with Germany on September 10th, 1939. They, they do, they do <laughs> go through the moment yeah, right, right. of independently declaring war. Right. Uh, on that too, Jesse, sorry, Sam Cavell. Um, to what extent do you think the Australian realignment or, and the, the decision to start building their own ships is actually an early movement towards a realignment with the United States. Yes. And a sense that these are going to be our great protectors and more in a Canadian direction rather than yes. away from I, I do in short. Yes. And and in fact I think you can you can keep going um, farther and farther back if you want to. Mm -hmm. Although I, and I'm thinking here of um, you know when Roosevelt sends the, the Great White Fleet out and the Admiralty is very shifty about this. And there's all this politicking going on between the Dominions, or the, they're not the Dominions at the time, but between the, the colonial governments and, and Britain about the future. And these ships are invited to Australia and New Zealand as a way of just sort of showing the British, the Admiralty, like what the future is going to look like if they don't play ball with, with the Dominion delegation. So yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. You, you, you can trace, I think, the future of that realignment Quite, quite far back, um, you know, into the 19th century, if you, if you wanted to. Did we have a question? We do have a question in the chat. We do have a question in the chat from Bradley Cesario. It's for Dr. Beeler. And the question is, during this repoliticization process beginning in the late 1880s, do you see either of the major political parties gaining more advantage or being more successful? Is this a conservative strength in an era that sees many liberal political victories? And you can hear my dog in the background arguing for conservative yeah. strength. Uh, Bradley, that's a great question. And Beresford is a conservative MP. Uh, the Royal Navy then, as most military institutions today, leans conservative, decidedly leans conservative. But at the same time, the liberal counter arguments to the spirit of the age are really lame. Um, the, they keep adducing Richard Cobden's, oh, if, I, if naval supremacy was threatened, I'd spend 100 million pounds on it. And they don't really advance very far beyond that. It doesn't help matters uh, that William Harcourt is not staunchly Gladstonian, that, you know, eventually he breaks down and changes sides, that Gladstone is so obsessed with Irish affairs that he won't muster. Well, he's 83 years old, too, for heaven's sake, and this makes a difference, uh, and that, you know, rather than fighting to the last ditch, he just throws in the towel at a certain point. And on top of that, the one liberal politician who probably can counter the arguments of the conservatives and the navalists effectively is George John Shaw Lefebvre, 
who had served in the Admiralty in the 60s, served at the Admiralty in the 70s, served at the Admiralty in the 80s, and he's an isolated figure in his own party. Uh, he's not well liked. Uh, he's, he's this rather acerbic, acidic personality. And he publishes a pamphlet, a very detailed pamphlet, re basically rebutting the uh, navalist arguments. But the fact that he is a marginalized figure probably really hurts. The, the, the liberals don't have any good front bench arguments against the navalists, even though I think they're right, essentially. James and then, and then Ryan. Hi, I'm James Levy from Oxford University. Um, question about Washington. Um, the thing that, that's always interested me is that there are multiple bluffs going on. Um, and two things that, that are fascinating to me is the assumption is, is basically the Americans are actually going to build these ships. And also the assumption is made that if we give Japan Parity, somehow they're going to find the funds and the resources to, to build up the parity. And both of those assumptions have always struck me as being a little rocky, especially the set. This fear, and this might have something to do with your work, this fear of Japan, that is Japan voting. Um, as if Japan was going to match the United States and Britain, even if you gave them that. They couldn't possibly do it. They were going broke just trying to finish the wood. I mean, uh, and the idea that, that Harding is a, 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 a Midwestern isolationist Republican who wants to cut taxes is going to build all these ships. Okay? He don't want to build those ships. You don't want to go, but it always seems to be that everybody at the at this thing, especially on the British side, assumes both that the Japanese and the Americans are going to build all these ships. Oh, we have to stop this before it starts because they're going to build like maniacs. And I'm fascinated by this this idea that in both cases, I think they're kind of fluffy, and the British kind of fall for it. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so I guess this is kind of drawing on this sort of like two level game of, of politics, right? Where you're kind of trying to guess what the domestic audience will do to sort of regulate the, the international or, mil or military one. And, and I think for me, the, the more hilarious assumption in the, in, in the short term is that it's the US Congress that might blow all this up. Everyone's worried about that. The, the British delegation like won't stop talking about this. Like, sure, we can make these agreements. Fine. Everybody knows it's going straight to hell as soon as it hits the floor of Congress. <laughs> Why should we even bother having these talks, given the track record of this deliberative body for assenting to them, right? The irony of that is that, like, two years later, it's Ramsey McDonald and British labor that, you know, throw a wrench into a lot of this stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's actually the threat is that the threat is at home, like the disruption is at home um, of the way democracy has this way of complicating, um, let's say, these, these grand pronouncements. And I think like from, from a political science perspective anyway, you know, the way the Japanese state and the way the Japanese sort of selectorate, to use like a jargon word, is evolving away from that um, model and into something else in the interwar is like a big question that people don't quite know how to answer. Um, to what extent do people's priorities matter and how do they matter when the institutional side of things is, is changing that way and evolving in a different direction? Um, I think we've got time for two more, so Ryan and, the, and then the gentleman in the back corner. So uh, Ryan Wadley, uh, Naval War College. So two questions for Jesse. I think that's still the short. Uh, first off, um, so you mentioned the British reaction to the cruise of the Great White Fleet. What was their reaction to the cruise of the Battle Fleet to Australia and New Zealand in 1925? John, you did a whole the article about the about service that. squadron. No, 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 no. When the, when the, when the, when the battleships uh, cruised to Australia uh, after the conclusion of what is it, uh, Fleet Problem Four and Grand Joint Exercise Three, uh, I mean, it's partially a test of 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 you know, can the battleships do a sustained cruise across the Pacific? But there yeah. is a, a 
at least I know from the American perspective, I'm wondering how the British reacted to, to, to the scene. How the, I, see, I don't know about how the British responded to it. I know the yeah. Australian press is always very, you know, yeah. depending on which part of it you're talking about, like yeah. the Murdoch press, which is active from, you know, the turn of the century, had always been kind of very, um, you know, happy to have kind of moments like this. But as, a, as the British press, I'm not actually, I'm actually not there, sure. There yeah. is an interesting sort of strange combination between wider Anglo-Saxon specific connections, etc., but also pronounced it's not an anti-American sentiment as much as it is a sort of, I mean, this is a period of kind of, you know, you just you talked about liminal stages in terms of, of, of national development, but it's also a, an era of liminal development in terms of national identity. And so there's this, you know, kind of, uh, in many ways, what you see is actually a, as much as we associate the Anzac uh, identity as kind of coming into play during this period, there's also a very, very strong and pronounced British sense of Britishness. And, and I know, um, uh, uh, you know I, I've seen evidence of this in terms of visits of American war ships where it's kind of, you know, we need to be careful that we don't gravitate or that we don't rely too much on on, on the American Navy for fear that we will lose this connection with Britain. But I'll ask the Irish, Irish question that's there too. Sorry, yeah, you have question? yeah, the other related yeah. question is, um, so you were talking about uh, you know, kind of counterfactuals to, to Washington and, and, and the, the Anglo-Japanese alliance. Um, you know, I've, I've, what do you make of, uh, you know, I've always been kind of partial to Emily Goldman's take on, on the disarmament process in, in the 1920s, where her argument is, is the fact that, that, you know, after Washington, since no one really pays attention to maintaining the collective security part of Washington, and everyone just gets focused on naval ratios, right. that's why the system breaks down. Right. And, and so, so, you know, so yeah, had, you know, was there a way to, you know, what, what sorts of like collective security discussions could have been made yeah you know for 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 the Japanese to, to, to not just lose, lose them off right yeah I, I think um, one of one of the interesting things about the four power agreement is how how concrete the sort of spheres of interest outcomes of that of that thing are you know I had this kind of crappy map that I took a picture of out of Ian McGibbon's book with my phone uh, that shows you know like the, the lines of delineation that each you know sort of power has, and I, I, I guess I don't disagree with with that in general. Though, in practice, based on the sort of letter of the law and the Four Power Treaty, it's hard to look at such an aggressively sphere of influence oriented arrangement and feel like it was durable. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think the Australians felt that way too. Um, and 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 you have so much fuzz introduced into this by the league, right? The, the mandatory system. Is is a great, you know, kludge in in you know political history, and it, it's kind of unclear like how that will play into the process as well. Yeah. Um, so. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. First, uh, Christopher Gray, Foreign Policy Research Institute. Harding was not an isolationist. Was underestimated. Please read Manly Irwin, who's presented here twice in the last six years. His book on the Harding. Edwin Denby's Navy Department, which innovated the fleet marine force radar, ship, uh, ship to ship, ship to ship radio, and uh, floating naval logistics. And Manley's book is in a second printing University Press of America. Harding is actually a very thoughtful Republican. He opposes Article 10, not the League of Nations, but Article 10, where the League of Nations decides what wars we get into. That's just a correct. But I was reading about Vernon Sturdy, who was the chief of staff during World War II for the Australians. In the 20s, I think he's at the conference, but most of the Australians don't think the Singapore Naval Base is going to work. It's too far away. They think it's a joke. My question is, why do the Canadians, isn't there a white Canada policy like there is with the Australian Labor Party, a white Australia policy? What really angers the Japanese more than the shipping ratio at the disarmament conference it's the racial quotas for admitting Japanese citizens to the United States. And Hughes is not a racist. He's, Charles Evans Hughes founds the National Congress for Persons and Jews. He's the Chief Justice who rules on the two Scottsboro cases to greatly advance black civil rights. And um, Charles Evans Hardy supports the Dyer and I lynching bill. This is a case where the court is actually more advanced and bleeding heart and, and liberal in the best sense than the country. Why? Uh, tell us about Canada in 1922. Do they hate the Japanese as much as the people in California, Oregon, and Washington? That's what I want to know. Um, well, so about Canada, Canada has this rich 
sort of moment of, 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 of dealing with this color line question as well in this, in this moment. There's the Kamigatamaru incident, which um, kind of throws into relief this question of, of immigration and, and race. They don't have quite as an aggressive way of branding their policy as the Australians do. But well, it, or the American car jumps and right. the car shuts up in California. But but right, but it but but in many ways it's it's no less um, you know sort of ra racist and you know famously that there's discussion about the kind of Pacific coast becoming I, I think Roosevelt talks about this that if if this question is not adequately settled then British Columbia and California, but Oregon and Washington will become their own they will essentially secede and form their own state to answer the question um, for themselves um, that like that there's this actual question of secession um, along the sort of Pacific rim um, because of these sort of racist ideas of, of Asian exclusion and and those I think are transnational you know that they they obtain in along the Pacific rim in this in this era that's like increasingly dominated by these ideas of um, a kind of racially delineated international system and I, I think you know I think it's right that the, that the Japanese are fixated on this question, right? And that that also has a long history going back to the racial equality clause. And they, they did, certainly did not forget the way the Australians responded to that moment as well, um, and Hughes specifically. And that that kind of enmity, I think, is is a huge part of this story, for sure. I think we're, we're going to have to end it there off. because we're at five o'clock. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for all of their effort. Jesse, I wish you and your wife the very best of luck in the next couple of days. Uh, my apologies for not being there in person. Uh, I look forward to seeing most of you hopefully uh, in person at a conference uh, very soon. So thank you all for a wonderful panel. Thanks for letting me be a part of it. Uh, have a cocktail without me. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael.